Where many see challenges, we see opportunities. Where many look back, we look ahead. The old familiar ways are gone. The new normal is here. We cannot know what tomorrow will look like, but as a university, we can empower our students, staff and communities to thrive in change. That is why we at EIG put innovation at the centre of everything we do. We are dedicated to positioning RGU as a leading 21st century university that prepares you for the future. We do this by infusing innovation and entrepreneurship into every part of RGU, like designing innovation content for courses, running innovation challenges for students, or hosting staff workshops. Our events, resources, startup training programs, and accelerators provide a safe space to explore creative ideas, trends and technologies of the future. Our 46 RGU startups, which emerged through our Startup Accelerator program, have raised over 1.4 million in investment or revenue and created dozens of jobs in the economy. All of this is made possible by our award-winning EIG team, who are dedicated to making RGU a catalyst for innovation across Scotland and the UK. Here is to the change makers of tomorrow. Here is to the ones who make ideas happen. Here is to you. Well, good evening and welcome to the first Innovation Masterclass of the new academic year, coming to you live from Garth D in Aberdeen. It's a pleasure to have you on board. It's been a while. We wanted to give you all a bit of a break. We were all a bit zoomed out and teamsed out, but I'm delighted to say that this is the first in an hour series of masterclasses that we will be putting on for you. And we have an audience in the room. Say hello, give us a wave, give a wave to everyone at home, which is fantastic joining us. And we're also going out live on YouTube as well, and we'll be doing that the same over the next few months. And hopefully we can deliver an excellent 
hybrid event for you all. So my name's Chris Small. I'm the Head of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Robert Gordon University. And I'm actually riding high and away from my TEDx Aberdeen talk, which was a fantastic, it's a shameless plug, and I apologize for that, but it was a fantastic experience. I'd like to say th thank you very much to uh, Murray Barber and his team for putting that on. If you hadn't seen it, uh, go onto YouTube and, and Google TEDx Aberdeen. Uh, it was a real pleasure to, say, to share that uh, red spot with a number of other speakers who did a fantastic uh, ev event. Uh, they were inspiring, they were interesting, and that's, that's what we're kind of trying to do here with these masterclasses. So very much like the TEDx talks, these masterclasses are curated to inspire uh, entrepreneurship and innovation, share interesting stories, new ideas, and create that culture of curiosity. Now, um, I started my own business in 2000, and I've had three businesses since then, um, and they've all had varying successes. Uh, some of them have failed, some of them have, have done not too bad. Um, and tonight's theme is shining a light on startups and how to reduce the risk of failure. Um, and obviously, we've been through a global pandemic, and that's had a huge impact on businesses over the past 18 months. And I read recently that uh, in the official uh, national statistics that nearly 400,000 businesses closed in 2020, and they're predicting a further 250,000 are going to close this year. But we have seen a positive trend uh, throughout the crisis with a surge of businesses. And we're actually looking at, in the UK, entrepreneurs are fighting back. We're seeing last this year we should have 770,000 new businesses starting, which is it's fantastic and just uh, epitomizes the entrepreneurial spirit of the British people. Um, some of them are in areas like online mail ordering or um, online shopping. Takeaway food shops has risen as well. And one RGU startup that's going for strength to strength is with us tonight. So I'm delighted to introduce to you two entrepreneurial architect graduates, Ali and Sheehan, who have come through our accelerator program and have successfully launched their business. And I'd like to invite them to share with you their story. Alistair and Sheehan. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Sheehan, and this is Alistair together. With our last year of university, we created Arculing, and this is just a bit about our story and what we've been up to so far. So I remember we had a lecture from Chris, and I think Ed was there as well, down in the architecture building. And they came across and they said, look, if you come up with an amazing idea, we'll get £10,000 funding. And Sheehan and I kind of looked at each other and we're like, okay, <laughs> we'll think of something. Um, and we'd both been out in practice that year, and we had noticed a couple of things that we thought we could maybe change and we started developing a business plan where you could post looking for an architect and then get connected with three architects, get a really easy quote and get some free advice from them. And we started trying to put that together. Um, before the accelerator window closed, we managed to get a business plan together and we were lucky enough to be accepted onto that. So during the accelerator, the first thing we created was a Wix website. So we kind of learned using YouTube just to test if it would actually work. Would anyone actually want to find an architect online? Would architects actually want leads online? And that was phenomenal, because we actually got such great feedback using the Wix website. Since then, we've now created an actual properly working website that's now live with over 200 architects uh, UK-wide using the service. And about 70% of Manchester architects use our service now. We've got already got org organic results happening over time now with the website. And we first created the website, one of the key things uh, which we were paying for was Google leads and paying for like Facebook advertising because we wanted to drive traffic to the website. Since we've been up and live, we, we're starting to see a lot of organic results. A lot of homeowners are recommending us to their neighbors. A lot of architects are coming on, on board using the service without us having to advertise to them. While the lead generation was the main idea and it was something we drove towards making amazing for at least the first year, we've actually found ourselves doing other things as well. Um, so we've while we were building that, we started to do site surveys and CGIs for the architects. We use the latest technology, the LiDAR scanners, um, and we make amazing CGIs like artwork for them to show their clients. And we've kind of found over time that that's where most of our money's come from. And while the, we've grown 200 relationships with architects across the UK, they then use us to do other things as well. And we have started became an outsourcing company for architects, and we provide a various number of services now. That's amazing because, like Ali was mentioning, the outsourcing side, you never think you would stumble into 
Because when we first met with Chris, the first idea we had was connecting homeowners to architects. That's what we thought Arclink was going to be. Then after two years on, we've now got different revenue streams, which we still, we're still in the same uh, architecture category, but we're providing different things to architects now. And that's sort of, we're, s we're starting to see like daily, our time's now spent doing different things uh, throughout the business, which is amazing. Yeah, we're both full-time on Archilink. So we came straight out of uni, straight into full-time on this company. And we now employ one person for the lead generation side, uh, two people for the site survey side, and one person for the CGIs. Um, so we've got a little team that's growing, and we're kind of hoping for get bigger in the future. Yeah, I mean, without the sort of the innovation team, like doing that presentation, we were thinking we were going to be architects when we graduate. We didn't think we'd be graduating with a business. So it's, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali and Sheehan. And where can people find out more about your, is it um, the website? Yeah, Do you want to put Social media, Archilink, A-R-C-H-I-L-I-N-K. And Archilink surveys for the other side. So yeah, if you, if you get, get an opportunity, go and have a look. Um, they've been on an, an incredible journey. Like you say, I remember when we first, first met you, um, you had an inkling of an idea, and now they're working full time. So it's a great, a great story and a great journey. Um, but uh, you know, true entrepreneurs, they've, they've been very entrepreneurial, they've been very coachable, worked very hard as well, because entrepreneurship isn't for everyone, it's hard work, and you have to be dedicated and give up your weekends and resilient. But the, the guys have done a fantastic job, so that's brilliant. So without further ado, I'd now like to move on straight on and introduce uh, my colleague, the Vice Principal for Economic Development, Danella Beaton, who is going to introduce our masterclass speaker. Thanks, Danella. Maybe you also think after looking at the Archilink jackets and everything, which are now, we're now, I'm now seeing the Archilink t-shirt coming out from underneath the Archilink jacket, so lots of branding going on. <coughs> Thank you, Chris, and a huge welcome both to those of you in the room here and also to those joining online as we open this first of our series of RGU Innovation Master Classes. I've been a keen attender of these events myself over the last three years, not because I have to, it's not always because I'm presenting as I am tonight, but actually because every time I learn something new, Prior to coming to u university, I ran a company for quite a number of years, but every night and every event still allows me to increase my knowledge and also to take more back into the university. So why does RGU do these events? One of the university's key strategic themes is to stimulate economic development. This has been particularly important through the pandemic itself, but also now as we work together with partners to aid recovery and also to seek um, prosperity for the region and for the nation. Innovation and entrepreneurship plays a key role in this activity, not only in creating jobs and building the prosperity, but also making a positive contribution to communities and to the social and cultural fabric of the region. Over the past three years, the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Group has advanced RGU's vision as being an innovative and impactful in university, assisting students, staff and graduates with their entrepreneurial ambitions. And through the Accelerator program alone has helped support 65 new startups. And on top of that, and many more through the Creative Entrepreneurship Program and the Entrepreneurship Summer School. The Innovation Masterclass Series invites on innovators, entrepreneurs, and inspirational speakers from all walks of life to share their stories and provides insights into their area of expertise or their particular journey so that it can actually inspire the RGU community. I think it's therefore particularly important that we, for this very, very first event of this year, we're here to welcome Mark Logan. Mark has over 25 years of senior leadership experience in the internet technology sector. He was instrumental in the success of multiple startups, including a CEO of Skyscanner, one of Europe's most successful technology companies. So what about some of his highlights? In 2014, the Institute of Directors named him Director of the Year, and in 2016, he won the UK Digital Masters Award for Excellence in General Management. He was appointed Women's Enterprise Scotland's first male ambassador in 2017, 
and in 2019 he was confirmed with the honorary degree of Doctor of Science by the University of Glasgow, and these, don't th these things don't come easy. Now, since leaving Skyscanner, Mark's focus has been as a startup scale-up advisor, as an investor and a non-executive director in Scotland and internationally. He's also a professor at the University of Glasgow School of Computing Science, a senior fellow at Strathclyde University's Innovation Centre, and an advisor to the Scottish Government on Technology Policy. In 2020, Mark was commissioned by the Scottish Government to undertake a short life review into how Scotland's technology sector could contribute to the com country's economic recovery post-pandemic. This is often referred to as the Logan Report and is of huge interest to universities such as RGU, but also to the wider higher education sector. Now, unlike many, Mark needs to practice what he preaches, as he has been asked now to lead the government's implementation of his own review. So definitely, definitely watch out what you promise to do in the future. It's therefore our pleasure and our honour to welcome Mark. I'm delighted that he has also agreed to answer a few questions after the speech. So if you're watching on YouTube, do add some questions into the chat function. And I know that we're also going to take some questions here in the room. So with no further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mark Logan. Well, thank, thank you very much for that introduction and congratulations to Ali and Johan and their really inspiring story. And I wish you guys the very best with your the future of your business. So we're going to talk in the next uh, few minutes about the topic of why startups fail. But really, of course, what we're trying to talk about is how do they succeed? It's just that sometimes when you start from that question, you end up in a land of anecdote and attribution bias, etc. And a lot more startups fail than, than succeed. So it's actually easier to study why that happens and then figure out how to how to avoid that. So we're going to try and do that. But we're very much looking at this topic with a view to how do we build successful companies. And you know, there's there's obviously you know luck and flashes of brilliance and all those other things that go into being successful. But what I'd like to try and impart in our session this evening is technique, because very often a brilliant founder who has a bit of luck still fails because they lack technique. And you don't want to be a founder who learns technique through too many failures. So we're trying to skip a few steps here. So we're going to talk about technique. And I'm going to, I'm going to use examples from you know, the tech startup world, but I've tried to think of uh, examples that are transferable beyond any particular narrow field. So I hope that these will be applicable to everybody. And you know, be, be that a consumer business or a, a B2B business or, or something else. So to, to start with, with, let's consider the question of, of you know, how do, we, how do we know if we're on the way to success or how do we know if we're actually in the process of failing? It's all, always quite obvious after the fact, but it'd be much better to know during our efforts if we're actually going in the right direction. It's often very hard to tell. Let's take an example. So I think we've all heard of Clubhouse, I'm sure. This is the much-hyped drop in audio app um, that exploded onto the scene in 2020. You might remember that you could only get an invitation to, to Clubhouse. You couldn't just download and start using it. So that drove a lot of interest. Now, if I was to ask the question, the Clubhouse is still, of course, a, you know, a, a active current product. Is, is it on the way to success or is it on the way to failure? Um, so you know, if you knew that, if you, if you knew you were heading for failure, you could take action. So, so how's Clubhouse doing? Well, if you look at the early data up to quite recently, in fact, you can see these great uh, apparent user figures that Clubhouse publishes. And we all want that. And that feels like success, doesn't it? That feels like this company's heading for, for success. But then just you know, a couple of months later, you start to see these headlines. You know, does anyone still use Clubhouse, et cetera, et cetera? Clubhouse downloads are falling off a cliff. So you know, how can those things both be true in more or less the same quarter uh, of a calendar year? Well, I've always found it actually quite valuable to use Google Trends to figure out if a company's succeeding or failing. Because you know, Google Trends will, will, of course, I'm sure you know, give you a sense for how often people are searching for this, this term. And although you know, Google Trends is predominantly used on a desktop, and of course Clubhouse is a mobile app predominantly, 
it, it's a very good proxy for public interest in an app and, and for organic uh, you know, new, new users coming into, into a product. Now, if we look at Clubhouse, for example, it's a pretty mixed picture. We can see a, you know, a bit of a, a spike as we come into the February period, just as those uh, graphs suggested. But then, then it seems to drop and it doesn't really seem to recover. Now, what this, this picture tells is that something's not necessarily right. But if you, if you read you know, what the company talks about and some of the articles that appear, it'd be very hard to discern that the company may not actually be on its way to success. Now, if I put this same chart alongside uh, another recent product phenomenon, TikTok, you, you start to see that, you know, success looks different from what Clubhouse is experiencing right now. So, you know, compared to TikTok, albeit TikTok's a very uh, rapidly growing application, you can see that that it's a, you know, it could well be the case that Clubhouse isn't going to be successful, and we don't know the answer to that yet. But if I was in Clubhouse, I'd be very concerned. I'm sure they are. So you've got to kind of find ways to look beyond the hype and the anecdotes and the headlines to underlying structures of what tell us what, if we're not we're on the way to success or, or failure. And that's what we're going to start to to look at in this this session today. Here's another example from a bit further back. We mentioned TikTok there. This is this is um, a, a product from you know some time back about ten years ago called Vidi, which was the one of the first social media apps that tried to use video as its currency. And this case is even more extreme. You can see here that uh, using the same interest index, which again is a proxy for signups, and it's quite a reliable proxy for signups. That between uh, you know January and May of of um, two thousand twelve, interest in Vidi just exploded and. You know, not surprisingly, people assumed the video was going to be really successful. And they were able to, you know, generate these kind of headlines that you can see here. So, you know, this is taken from uh, Venture Beat, and this was the headline, video sharing, sensation, et cetera, et cetera, rockets towards 30 million users. And at the top of that graph I just showed you there, they, they received investment to tune of $30 million. So, you know, we think about the sophistication of, venture capital firms and all the data they look like look, look at and all the due diligence they do. Um, and you know, we think of them as pretty sophisticated organizations. And this sophisticated set of VCs invested in Vidi at the, the peak here. And uh, the mistake that they made was that they invested in a company with 30 million registered users. That's not the same as people who are still using the product. And it's amazing how often very sophisticated investors basically fall for the hype and you know snoop dogs attached to your product what what could what could go wrong but just shortly after um this period this is what happened to to Vidi. so it, it, the the registered users were not active users and the whole thing collapsed and disappeared it was a very painful downhill ride so these are quite sobering pictures um we don't know if clubhouse is going to follow this path but very, very often companies that appear to be successful are actually on their way to be not being successful. And I think if we could understand, again, why that is, we'd be more likely to be able to take corrective actions and uh, avoid these kind of outcomes. These are more extreme, but this same uh, phenomenon, if you like, happens in less extreme ways to most startups. So it's very important that we, we embrace and get to grips with this. So if we start to look at the question of, you know, why do startups fail what causes these kind of patterns you know people aren't stupid to start companies so if it was obviously failing they would they would try and do something about that but failure is often something that suddenly appears although it was in the background if only we'd known how to how to look for it so that's what we're trying to investigate in our session tonight so you know there's a number of reasons for this and um, we, we can't do justice in you know 30 minutes to this vast subject but let's try to provide a framework that you can then build on. So the first reason that a lot of startups fail is because they didn't have product market fit and, and we knew we didn't have it. And uh, you know, you, there's a lot written about product market fit. I'm sure if you're at uh, you know, the university here, you probably are familiar with the term, but it, that, this is about, you know, does the market actually want to use your product? And it's actually very hard to establish that, but, the bigger problem that we have is quite often we think we have product market fit and we don't. And therefore, we, on the basis of having product market fit, so we think 
we start to hire people, we start to spend money on marketing, we start to try and grow into new markets. But actually, the market doesn't want our product, but it's just not obvious. So there's a, there's a very sort of fine line between not yet having product market fit and, but, and knowing that when you take certain actions to get it. And a much more dangerous case, which is very common, where you still don't have product market fit, but you've decided that you do, and you start scaling from there, burning through investment money, and then crashing and burning. So we're going to spend some time today on this particular phenomenon because it's it's very, very common. I mean, it's very, very common. Another case we have to look at, another pathology, is where we actually did manage to get product market fit, but we didn't have the other fits. Now, what are the other fits? Well, we'll come on and talk about those as part of this session, but they're just as important as product market fit, but hardly anyone talks about them. So a business might you know, be doing well with a group of users, but it fails in the other fits, and so it eventually fails. So as a founder or a member of a, a startup, you've got to be really strong on chasing all of the fits. There's four in total that we're going to talk about, and it's really important that you understand that they exist and you understand where you are against each of those four fits. So let, let's move forward here now. Let's start with product market fit. Now, the problem with product market fit is that the definitions are not particularly helpful. So you, you, you might well have heard of the Lean Startup. If you haven't, I highly, highly recommend you read that book. But um, even there, defining when you've got product market fit is, is a little bit fuzzy. And I've, I've taken four quotes here from some of the industry's leading uh, you know, thinkers in the Silicon Valley, et cetera, about what, uh, what product mark, market fit is. But you can see these are all somewhat um, attributional, uh, somewhat anecdotal. They're, they're not particularly useful in helping you find product market fit. You know, they tell you, you know, you'll know what it is when you've got it. They don't tell you how to actually get to it. So that means that finding product market fit is always, often very, very difficult for people. And what we'd like to explore in this session is how do we usefully know when we have product market fit? There's obviously a whole bunch of art and science to experimenting and building products and having product vision. But how do we know that's taking us to product market fit? You know, how do we know we're on the journey towards it? If you know we're on the journey towards it, that's super helpful in a startup. And if you know you're not, then there's still a chance to take action. So we, we would love to get some systematic insight into this question of are we heading towards product market fit or not. So let's now explore that. Well, we'll start with this uh, user journey. This is what most users, certainly in consumer products, go through. And most users in B2B products do the same thing. We often you know, struggle to understand how to relate consumer and B2B products. But think about, about the customer in a, in a B2B scenario as a, as a corporate, for example, but the users are still individuals who act, like consumers, you know, if people in a company don't want to use a product, then eventually the company will stop paying for the product subscription. So actually consumer and B2B are very similar uh, cases. And in all cases, users go through this type of a uh, journey. So we start with being acquired. So that means that we basically brought users to the product, you know, either by marketing efforts or word of mouth or, or something else, but they've arrived with awareness of the product. And our job next as a company is to activate those users. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means it's getting them into a habit around the product, so establishing a habit for the first time. So, for example, in this case of Skyscanner, one of the companies I, I was involved in, um, activating a user means that whenever I want to book a flight, I think of Skyscanner and I go there first. Um, if I want to book a hotel, the chances are I'll go to booking.com first. These are these are habits that I've formed. If I want to talk to my friends, I'll use my messenger app of, of choice. These are habitual. We don't think about this. We just earn that habit. And it's very important that to, to keep users that we can activate them into a habit. And once we've got them in that habit, we have to retain them in that habit. And you know, over over the long term, and retention is an incredibly important state in the state machine because while my users are retained, I can monetize them in some way, or can show them ads, or charge them for products that they buy, or charge them subscriptions, for example. And I can also encourage them to tell other people about the app as well or the product, which in turn gives me a new channel for activation. So 
Um, this is the kind of model that users go through. And the most important state here is retention and its cousin activation where we're trying to get people into a retained state. And you know, this is where mistakes start to come in. Uh, in most cases, people start to go wrong at this point. Because first of all, we've got to ask ourselves the question, well, what does it mean to actually retain a user? Well, what that means is that users are activated in a habit and remain in that habit. And what does it mean to be active? That, that's that's kind of a key mistake that we often make. So for example, um, it's very common for companies to fall into this, this following trap. I'm showing you three lines here. We're looking at the, um, the, the green line and the blue line, which is essentially the cumulative signups or downloads or, of, a, of a product. Whereas on the y-axis, on the right-hand axis, we're showing activity, active users. Now you can see that if we were in a board meeting and I was showing these graphs, we'd all be pretty pleased. Investors would be signing up. This is very much like the video example I showed you earlier. Um, because cumulative graphs, your signups and downloads, they never go down. They always go up because of cumulative graphs. So they're, they're beautiful vanity devices. We all feel good about the up into the right graphs. But for this same business, you can see here that the active users are dropping and the business is on the way to failure. So the first thing you have to do if you want to be successful in finding product market fit is understand the difference between your vanity metrics, like downloads and so on, and active user metrics. That's the first thing. So are people active? And secondly, you've got to have a, an understanding of what does it mean to be active? You know, it's not enough to open the app occasionally. You've, you've, got, to, you've got to have something that's stronger. And that stronger means that some combination of frequency and action that the user does, it correlates with them still being retained in a, a year's time, for example. So first, is, first thing you need to do is inculcate this idea of activity is far more important than signups. And secondly, you've got to strive to think about what is our measure of activity that's meaningful and correlates with later retention. So in Skyscanner, there have been people booking uh, flights, for example, or, or regularly searching for flights at a certain frequency. Um, it wouldn't just be someone opening the app and closing it again every so often. So, you know, think about frequency and uh, at particular action and which combination of those most correlates with users still being around in three, six and 12 months. And that's essentially your active user metric. So you've got to assert that in the early days. We have a lot of users, then refine it as you go forward. And if you don't do that, you'll never have visibility into this yellow graph here and you need that visibility. So with those two points established, let's now look at just how important retention is and why retention is the thing that you should focus you know, much of your attention on, even though in most startups, we don't look at it at all. We look at signups and downloads and marketing activity. This graph here is showing us what would happen, assuming we had a good definition of active users and it was the right one. If we were in a situation where we never lost any users that we signed up. Now you can see here that you know, on the x-axis, we have time periods that could be weeks or months. Let's call it months for sake of argument. And on the left-hand side, on the y-axis, we can see the number of users that are active. Now, even in a situation where we don't lose any users, you can see that this graph eventually goes horizontal because eventually we run out of, of new people to sign up in that market. So even in a perfect situation, we'll eventually top out. Let's now x-ray this graph and see what's actually happening inside. So same graph, but now we're looking at it cohort by cohort. So what that means is that in time period one, we sign up the users at the bottom there in gray. So about a thousand users. In time period two, we then signed up a little bit less because there weren't as many users uh, in the market. It was harder to find those that were left. And the evangelists tend to sign up first followed by the quite interested, followed by the casual user who are not that, that interested in your product, but eventually some of them will sign up when you market to them. So you can see that as you go through time, it gets a little bit harder to sign up the next batch of users. The next batch of users becomes a little bit smaller. And eventually the cumulative effect is that we top out there. But that's, that's, that's all right because it's a business. You know, you've got a lot of users and 
um, you can make money off that. You know, Facebook would be an example of that. Now, let's now add in 1% churn, which is to say that in every time period, 1% of the users that were active in the previous time period now decide to leave the product. It doesn't sound like a lot. Sounds like almost immaterial. But let's see what effect that has. Well, the graph now looks similar, but you can see that it doesn't rise nearly as high as it did before. And also it starts to decline. And if we x-ray this chart, we can see that actually all of the cohorts are now starting to narrow as we go through time. So this is, I guess, okay, because we've got plenty of time to perhaps open new markets, innovate in the product, um, you know, optimize the product, try and find ways to improve retention, bring some users back. We still have a business here, but the point here is that even with 1% churn, we are, we are slowly dying unless we take uh, special, special measures. Now, if I was to turn that dial a bit more now from 1% to say 5% or 10 or 15 or 25, you can see how very, very quickly the picture becomes quite catastrophic. So if in every um, you know, time period we lose 10% of the users uh, that were active in the previous time period, very quickly we don't have a business. And it's very easy to lose 10% of your users, um, especially if you haven't got them in to a habitual state and you haven't made that the purpose of your business. For as far as most startups are concerned with how many signups can we get and how many new users can we bring on board, it's much, much more valuable, although that's important and you can't do without some focus there, to focus on how do we keep the users that we have because if we do that, we know that they'll monetize for us. They'll tell lots of other people about us, which will bring in its own uh, its, its own um, source of acquisition. And we heard Ali and Shahan earlier talk about how they're, they're not having to market to uh, their user base now. People are just telling their friends. They'll only do that when they're retained. So it's an incredibly important state. So this is all fine, but how do we get that foresight that I was talking about. This is all still somewhat after the fact. You know, we don't want to find out after 25 months that the business is dead. How do we get foresight into that problem so we know how things are going? We can take optimizing steps. We can narrow in to those areas where we need to optimize. Well, let's, let's see if we can transform this view into a more um, predictive view. So, and by the way, I should just say that the graph we've just been looking at looks a lot like a real, real world examples we saw it in Viddy. This is Farmville. You may have heard of Farmville, very popular Facebook game back in the day. It was had a lot of hype and then suddenly it just disappeared with this same graph, simply because people were playing the game once, telling their friends, but then they weren't playing it twice or three times. And this classic uh, failure graph appeared. So let's see if we can improve on that. And the point here is that retention dominates eventually. That's the thing to remember out of this particular section, we've got to have insight into it, but how do we get foresight into it? So going back to this graph here, let's pick one of the, the lines now, this is the 25% case, and let's see if we can transfer this view into something that we can take action on earlier before things start to, to go badly wrong. So first of all, we can x-ray this chart and we can see the same thing as before, only this time those cohorts that used to be horizontal are each uh, narrowing rapidly and the cumulative effect is this graph that we see uh, as we just saw earlier. So let's take one of these cohorts now and see if we can represent this cohort differently. So rather than show it narrowing through time, uh, let's plot it as a percentage graph. So what we're gonna do is say, in time period one at the start, you know, 100% of the users who signed up are active. Of course they are, because by definition, we've just started. And then let's plot what happens in later time periods relative to the first. How many are still active after time period two, time period three, and so on? Now, if you do that, you get a view like this with one of three outcomes. So on the left-hand axis here, we can see 100% of users are active at the start of this cohort. And as we move away from that point where they signed up, you know, the graphs diverge. And you can lay lots of different cohorts on top of each other, all signed up at different times to see how this behavior is developing. Now, the three cases that we see here are, first of all, the graph at the top, the green graph. And 
you can see here that we always lose some users after sign up because not everybody who signs up activates. Um, you know, they might have signed up casually to have a look, but they didn't form a habit. You always lose some users because of that. But what you want is that ideally you lose as few as possible during that activation stage. But what, but you're in a good position if that graph goes horizontal. In other words, you stop losing users after activation and you retain them over time. And if you're heading towards a graph like that, then you're in very good shape. If you're experiencing the middle graph, the yellow graph, then what's happened here is that we lost a bunch of users uh, at the start, which you know is going to happen, but we're still slowly losing users over time. We're not keeping people in the habit state. Now, that's not catastrophic because we've got time to act in this case. And then we get to the red graph, which kind of is catastrophic because we lose users after activation and we just keep losing them at more or less the same speed. And we don't have a lot of time to recover that. Now, if we were to lay those three charts against the macro picture we've been looking at earlier, they loosely correspond to the three pictures you can see. And the top here, this corresponds almost to having no churn at all. But yes, we had some at the start, but as long as it levels off, we've got a pretty good proposition on our hands. That's a beautiful place to be. Obviously, if it leveled off down at 30%, we'd want to try and bring it up to 60 and so on, but we've got something to work with. The yellow graph corresponds to that kind of 1% churn case here where we're leaking users over time, but we've still got time to act. And on the red case, this is equivalent to the Vidi graph, to the, the uh, Farmville graph, and maybe perhaps who knows even to the clubhouse situation. Um, these cumulative individual cohort graphs cumulatively add up to this, this catastrophic decline. So another way of putting all that is viable business if you've got the green graph, heading for failure if you've got the red, and work to do if you've got the yellow. And you will probably find uh, if you plot these graphs that you've almost certainly, when you start a business, got the yellow graph. You're extraordinarily fortunate if, you, if you're early on at the green graph. But if you know that, you can organize your whole company around making that yellow graph go, go green, go to the horizontal. And that should be a big part of any startup, but it often isn't. In fact, you know, I would say that this chart is the most important single graph any startup should have, but almost all startups don't have it because they, either they're tracking vanity metrics or they don't understand what an active user is or haven't really thought about it or thought about it in a very casual way, um, or they haven't plotted this graph or they're not plotting these graphs over time, like every week and every month to see how cohorts are improving in line with the work that they're doing to improve the product. So you could go, you could do a lot worse than to build your growth strategy around this chart. Um, so that would be my sort of advice that you, that you do that. So how do we usefully know when we've got product market fits? Um, or heading towards it? The answer is when our cohort graphs flatten out, it's somewhat as simple as that. Obviously, there's a lot of art and science in what you decide to do to your product to get them to flatten out, but this is your compass for startup success. So remember this chart, and if you haven't got it, start figuring out how you're gonna get it. Now, there are a few gotchas in here. So this is a picture from the uh, taken from the New York Times back in March 2020, um, right at the start of the COVID pandemic. And it tracks the things that President Trump was saying at the point where COVID was just entering the US. And you can see that you know in January 30th, so round about here in the graph, if you can see my mouse, um, he's saying we've got things under control, we've only got five cases, et cetera, et cetera. February 26th, you know, so a bit further along here, the cases were still in absolute terms pretty low. And he was saying, we've only got 15 people and it's going to be down to zero pretty soon. By March, he was saying, we've only got 129 cases, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and so on. So what Mr. Trump was doing, of course, is he was making the mistake of looking at a point in time and taking that as indicative of the trend because we don't hire we don't, we don't handle rather exponentials very well as, as human beings. I think a lot of people fell into this, this trap. Now, what does this have to do with retention? Well, we, with retention, you've, you've often got the same problem in the other direction. So here's a common scenario. Um, I'm a, a startup founder and I go to an investor and I say, 
uh, you know, you should invest in my company. They say, you know, what's your retention? I say, it's great. You know, it was 80, 80%. They go, 80%? I've, I've read that's really high. So you're like an investable company. Um, but let's say I delayed that conversation and had it with a different investor after three months instead of one month. They'd say, what's your retention? I'd say, 50%. That's, that's pretty good. And say, yeah, I've heard that's pretty good. And, I, and I've heard these conversations happen. In fact, you can be sure you know, in the video case, for example, that's exactly the conversation that those uh, sophisticated investors probably had with, uh, with with that company's founders. But what if these are just two points in a graph like this? So that's the, that's our cohort graph we saw earlier, heading to zero. By any point in time, it can look all right. So you've got to be very, very careful with retention. Retention is a trend. It's not a number. It's a trend. And you've got to, if you're, you know, looking at a startup with a view to joining it or investing in it, or you're in that startup, seek the trends, not the absolute number. It can be very, very deceiving. So how we usefully know our startups uh, on the way to product market fit or has it or doesn't is around whether or not these cohort graphs flatten out and it's around trend. And that in turn requires you to know what an active user is so that you can plot those graphs. So we've looked at two cases here didn't have product market fit and knew it and didn't have it and didn't know it and how we can start to get insight into that, that problem. Let's now move on to the other fits that I mentioned. So we've got product market fit, but we don't have the other fits. Now, what are they? Well, this is maybe the second most important picture you should have in front of you if you're in a startup because it shows the main fits that you need to worry about. We've talked about product market fit already. So we won't go through that again, but you know, obviously it's important that your product fits the market's needs. But what about the others? Well, the, the next one that's equally important, I would argue potentially even more important at the outset is business model market fit. Now, what I mean by business model is very simple. It's how many customers can you find for your product and how, how much are they willing to pay? So for example, if you wanted to build a $100 million annual revenue business, just to pick a simple number, you can do that lots of different ways. You know, WhatsApp did it by having 100 million users and prior to their acquisition, charging a dollar per year after one year, that got 100 million revenue. That works because WhatsApp can credibly have 100 million dollars and people are probably willing in those days to pay a dollar for a better messenger app. Not now, but then. Dropbox, you know, it can get there by having a hundred dollar annual fees and having a million users. Very hard to have 100 million users, but, but for their product, a million users is perfectly reasonable to get 100 billion revenue. And SAP, well, you know, they're targeting really big companies for the main, you know, 10,000 is a reasonable uh, a market they could address and they're charging a lot more money. So they get to hundred million dollars. These are obviously just examples. These companies have broken through these barriers and so on in different ways, but it's just for illustration. But the point is that Many startups never ask themselves this question. So I've often seen startups who expect to charge a lot more for their product than people are willing to pay, or who only find you know 10,000 customers but are charging $5 per, per year, directly or indirectly. And that's not going to make a business that pays the salaries. So you've got to ask yourself the question, you know, does this market sustain the number of customers that I need and the price point that I require, that's business model market fit. What about business model channel fit? Well, you know, does, does the business model pay for the channel? So if you're WhatsApp and you're charging a dollar per user, you can't hire a sales team. You just can't do it because the, the revenue per user is not enough to pay for those additional um, you know, users you want to bring into the channel. So business model channel fit is, is equally important. And uh, it just reminds me that, you know, half of your product you don't own, half of it is the platforms you depend on. So as a product team, being really good at exploiting those platforms and optimizing for them, you know, for example, SEO landing pages is just as important as the core product. And many companies, we did this in Skyscanner, we were really strong in SEO when that was the major channel. Uh, and then we stopped paying attention to it. We had a great homepage for our website and terrible landing pages because we started to neglect them. But half of our users came in 
from those landing pages, it was half of our product. Google was half of our product and we ignored it. So it's very important to pay attention to your channels. Now, moving on here, product manual, does the product fit the, the channel? Not just the business model, but does the product fit the channel? Well, if you're trying to target uh, you know, young people, for example, you know, teenagers, and you're doing that with email, that's probably not going to be successful. So you know, the product has to fit the, the, the channel as well. So one way to do that, of course, nowadays is to get compounding growth where, where your users are your channel, where some users um, attract other users and some of those new people who are attracted in turn attract other users. For example, here's Hawken, which is a product that's in vogue right now. Extraordinarily growth. How is it doing that? Well, basically through a compounding growth loop, like one we just looked at. Um, some of the, the people who attend Hopin events become organizers of events who send invites. And some of those invites get opened by invitees who in turn attend the event, who, some of which become organizers and so on round. So channels aren't just about linear, you know, spending money in Google, et cetera. The most powerful channels, if you could possibly get them, are compounding growth mechanisms where your users are essentially out of the channel. So, you know, you can establish that you're in a very, very strong position. Example from WhatsApp, same idea. Some invitees sign up for WhatsApp and invite their friends in turn and a, a sign up and in turn invite their friends and so on round. So these are very important mechanisms. But a, in total here, we're saying that, you know, how companies fail is often because they didn't have product market fit. Uh, or they had it, but they ignored those other four fits. And my positive way of putting that to you is don't just pay attention to product market fit. Put that diagram in front of you and pay attention to all the fits. Does your business model fit the market? Can it pay for the channels? Does the product fit the channels? What are my channels? Are they affordable? You know, these questions occur at the start, at the outset of your startup and all the way through its life. Because things change, you want to target a, a new user, say a freemium user or a premium user, et cetera. That set of fits all changes and you've got to kind of look at it freshly. So very, very important. And number two in my list of important diagrams. Now to finish, let's say you've got all those things right. The bad news is that once you start growing your organization, growth itself will break your organization, which in turn will break your growth. So without going to a subject deeply, Another way of putting that is my warning to, you know, to any successful startup listening today is whatever works for you today organizationally will break tomorrow. And it looks a bit like this. You know, we're looking here at a graph of number of employees in the x-axis. So we're adding more people. We expect more outcomes. We expect more stuff to get done. That seems reasonable, doesn't it? We'd love to get disproportionately more outcomes. That's the dotted line. But we'd settle for more outcomes, you know, more product shipped, more, you know, uh, more uh, customers signed up, whatever it might be. But the reality is that you'll almost certainly get this, that once you get to about 30 to 50 people, maybe even sooner, you will find that you're still adding people, but you're not getting more outcomes. This is the most common situation. And uh, quite often, companies never leave that state. You know, they, they base, end up uh, essentially uh, staying in that position until they they run out of investment money, et cetera, and die. And if you break through that stage, you'll find that the pattern actually repeats itself. And what's happening here is that your know, organization is really three things. It's the people you have and their capacity to do stuff at your given level of scale. It's the structure you ask them to operate in, and it's the processes you ask them to operate within those structures. And as a business grows, those three things in combination tend to scale out and break. You know, I was good at managing two people, but I'm not good at managing 10 people, for example. Or our release process worked for, you know, three engineers, but it broke at six and so on. Very, very common problem. And you end up, if you do get through those inflection points, that you, know, you end up hitting new ones at different levels of scale. In fact, you know, I've come to the conclusion that this is actually predictable to a, a, a geometric uh, pattern here. And you can predict you're going to have the next in this graph here, for example, the next inflection point at 400 people and 800 people and so on. And even though you know it's coming and very hard to avoid. And my, my message, we could talk about this a lot more, but my message is that 
if you've got the fits right, if you've got product market fit and you've got visibility into that and you've got the other fits in place, you need to be thinking now about how you're going to scale your organization because what worked for you today will break tomorrow and you need to invest heavily in time, in your people and thinking about what structures you should be operating to, looking at companies you admire and what they did at the next level of scale. This becomes as important as the the thing that made you successful, which was the product and getting to market. And most founders neglect this. A lot of founders are proud of their ignorance about this topic, and uh, that's to their detriment. So to finish, we've talked about four areas that can cause failure, and I hope I've I've given you a sense for how to turn these into things to avoid or, or ways to avoid them. And uh, you know, if you bear these in mind, if you if you think regularly about how not to fail, you're far more likely to be successful. So wherever you are on that curve, I wish you the very best uh, of luck with that. And uh, I'm looking forward to our discussion to come now. That was a truly inspiring. I want to go and start up my next uh, company now. So, um, we do have time. You, you're happy to stay on and take some questions, Absolutely. Mark, aren't you? So we have had some a few on um, YouTube that are coming through as well. But my colleague uh, in the ID team, Graham Carter, is going to have a roving mic. Um, so we're going to take some questions also from the audience. So if anyone has a question in the audience, please raise your hand. Um, he does have some wipes, so he will be wiping the microphone to stay nice and COVID safe. Um, I've, I've, I've got one that's coming from uh, YouTube while we're waiting for some here. So this one, I think, is from um, Sam at eBar. And you might have answered this one already, actually, Mark. But are there any surefire ways that you can identify that you're heading for failure and then correct for? I think maybe that's going for one of, one of your graphs. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the way, in, in the context of our, of our discussion uh, tonight, one way you would do that is you would be plotting those graphs and you would find that they, they kind of come down and then they, they keep falling gently or fast and in every no matter what you did in terms of you know experimentation or <clears throat> changing the product or trying to re-engage re users if you can't get that graph to go horizontal you're you're heading for failure slowly or quickly because in the end what that tells you is in the long run you're losing all the users you paid for or signed up so i, I find that a useful starting point when I'm working with a startup I often ask you know can you show me that chart and the answer is usually no we can't we don't have it which is fine um, and then we go through a process of, of the business being able to surface that graph on a weekly or monthly basis so every week how many users or you know equivalent did we sign up um, after a few weeks how's that graph going uh, as we add things to the product or try new marketing techniques and so on and so forth is the graph are the, late, are the new cohorts more level than the previous ones? If they are, then we're probably heading towards a good outcome. If those graphs aren't responding or if they're actually getting worse, then we're heading towards failure. Um, so, because ultimately when you add all those cohort graphs together, you'll get one of these catastrophic graphs that I, that I talked about. So that's, that's a data way of, of telling. Um, there's other gut feel and experience ways and, you know, so on and so forth, what customers are saying to you, and you should certainly seek out all that sentiment. But from an objective data perspective, that's how I think about it. That's great. Another one from uh, YouTube, um, from uh, Tiburu, I think it is. Um, are there any big companies that completely bounced back after maybe having a similar graph or, or moving towards failure, maybe through a pivot or something? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't want to, for a second, give the impression that if you through that graph and found that you were heading that way, that that's you doomed. Um, it, it, what it is, is it's a, a, a focal point to tell you what's important. And what's important is how do we recover that position? Now, I, for a bigger company, so we're talking about startups and what I've just said, a bigger company has a similar, but potentially slightly different situation um, because bigger companies tend not to be at any point in time, launching a new and untested product, they tend to be bringing revenues in from existing products. Yeah. And 
Um, having these views is still super valuable because markets change. I mean, think of Microsoft, for example. Um, you know, go back a few years, and it's hard for people to remember how extraordinarily dominant Microsoft was. And it was all because of two products. It was Windows and it was Office. And um, then mobile came along and the world started to change. And Microsoft at the time wasn't changing with it. Microsoft still believed that a mobile phone was a small PC and should have a start button and a you know stylus and stuff to, to you know get as close to the PC operating system experiences as they could. Um, and you know, they eventually Microsoft realized that they were in big trouble and they pivoted, you know, extremely successfully eventually into being a platform agnostic uh, cloud company. So it is absolutely possible to do that. You know, go back further, IBM uh, went through an equally large, maybe even larger transformation uh, in its time. But you can just imagine how messy it was in those businesses and how many years were lost before they established that actually we're going to have to change here. And you know, had they cleaner data on you know, user engagement with their products, et cetera, they probably got there faster. So these things apply at all levels. Um, it's just sometimes a lot more difficult for big companies to, to um, I guess, forego their sunk costs and pivot, but it can be done. And we've seen Microsoft do it more than once in its lifetime, did it with the internet as well. So it certainly can be done. Yeah, okay. Anyone in the room? Any questions yet? We've got, oh, we've got one here. Is she, yep, is Sheehan from uh, Arculink. Oh, yeah, so one of my key questions is when you, when you mentioned Skyscanner, you said that SE, SEO was a big thing uh, at the beginning. Uh, what was the key areas that you, you looked at on the website for SEO? And also looking at the Google Trends that you started off with, it showed like the people that, that would search for Skyscanner or something similar. Was that something you used to begin with? Then you obviously created blogs or in, what, what was the key things that you added to the website to increase SEO? So, <clears throat> the, the, thank you for the question, Sean. The, the, the thing to remember, of course, is that we're going back, you know, um, over a decade here. So SEO is still a super important channel, um, but is not as powerful a channel as it used to be because Google now has put it, you know, well below the fold on mobile and somewhat down the page uh, with its own products and with its ads. So it's not as powerful a channel as it was back in our day, but it's still a very important channel. So what Skyscanner did was, you know, usually you'll have you'll have one channel that's a lot stronger than all the other channels. So you've got to become really, really good at that channel. Now, essentially how Skyscanner looked at the, the world, and I, I, I'll be first to say I wasn't in the business when uh, the company did this. This was way back at the start, so all credit to the, the, the original founders who did. Um, but what we did back in that time was basically said, you know, how, how do people search for, you know, for flights? And it's basically from here to there or some subset of that. So essentially the company generated hundreds of thousands of landing pages for pretty much every combination of major city to city routes that people would take and made landing pages of those and you know made sure that they were indexable and so on so that we would be uh, you know likely to be in the search results when uh, people searched for for root pairs so that was what was appropriate to us and the, the message there really is is that and I said earlier that you know half your products dependent on your on your larger platform that you depend on. You know we couldn't build those landing pages manually. You couldn't build those by getting some people from you know from the marketing department to build a few pages. That has to be auto generated. It's a coding issue. Now you need to infuse that with best practice. You know, so nowadays best practice on, on a landing page is different than it was ten years ago. You know, having social elements and active content, original content. These things are all scored in a given way nowadays. But if you want to really, um, you know, own your niche in there, amongst other things, you have to treat it as a as a product point. It's a it's a an, an engineering problem. It's not a you know it's not a marketing problem. It's you know it's both, and that's where nowadays you you often hear the term about growth engineering or growth teams. And growth teams are a hybrid of product engineering people and marketing people. 
you can't leave SEO to the marketing people. It has to be something that has an engineering underpinning because you can get it scaled. So that, that's how, how we thought about it. Um, there's obviously tactics that are readily available you know, to, to read about or agencies can help you with. Um, but uh, I, I would think about SEO as a product scale issue first and foremost before you think about it as a marketing issue, although it has a marketing element, clearly. Thanks, Mark. I think we've got another one in the room. Um, tech entrepreneur and RGU. Uh, Chamath has got a starting a tech company. Watch out for a tender coming soon. Uh, Chamath, what's your question for Mark? Um, so external party, so not the user. So third party provider, let's say you have aviation gateways, other external parties in your platform. So what are the strategies you use to get them on board? Let's say, for example, uh, airline ticketing engine or something like that. So how did you get them on board? Like what are the strategies you use to get external providers inside and maintain them? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting question because um, you know, li listening to um, you listening to Chahan Ali talk earlier about Archilink, um, what they're describing is a two-sided network. Um, you've got people who need architects on one side, and you've got architects on the other side. And the way such a network works is, and I'm sure people, a lot of people are aware of this already, but just to recap it, the the, the, the power of those networks is the more architects you have. The more you know, homeowners or people needing architects, I'll call them users for short, are going to come to your platform because there's a lot of uh, architects there and you're the place to go, you're the point of discovery. And the more users that are coming to your product, the more architects want to be on your product, which in turn attracts more users, which in turn attack, attracts more architects. So that you think of that as a spinning wheel and it spins faster and faster and faster. And there's lots of examples of two-sided networks and, and multi-sided networks. Skyscanner you know, was a multi-sided network, but for the sake of this discussion, it was a two-sided network of travelers and uh, travel suppliers, airlines and travel agents, for example. Now, the problem with two-sided networks is at the start, why would anyone be on it? You know, for example, why would an airline sign up with Skyscanner if there's no users? Because there's no benefit to doing that. And why would users sign up if there's no airlines? So the biggest problem with two-sided network businesses is how do you get them started? How do you get past that minimum energy requirement? And um, in the case of Skyscanner, I mean, usually the answer is to find a way to build supply. So what Skyscanner had to do was, you know, if we went to an airline and said, can you, can you join our platform? They didn't have the slightest interest. <clears throat> so what Skyscanner had to do was, in the very early days, I'm going back, but, you know, quite a long time now, well over a decade, is just scrape their websites and get their flight pricing and then wait for the lawyers to send us cease and desist letters, which they did, and then ignore those letters for long enough to bring enough users into the platform because we had those flights to bring enough traffic to those airlines that we could then go back to those airlines and say, we know you'd like us to switch off your, your flight prices, but do you realize that we now give you 5% of your business? Um, do you want to switch this off? And they say, oh, well, okay, maybe not. Uh, and then you, you're not making any money at this point. And then, you know, a, a bit later, you go back and say, but it's now 10% of your business. Would you like to pay us a little bit of money when we do this? And the answer eventually is yes. And eventually you build, a, you know, you get some market power and you go from there. <clears throat> that smooths out a lot of bumps and a lot of difficulties and a lot of anguish on the way. But that's basically how Skyscanner did it. Um, but to make it this transferable and more generalizable, you know, you've got to find a way of seeding one side of the network so the other one comes, which in turn means you don't have to seed the first side of the network so much anymore. And that's sometimes supply and it's sometimes demand. And you know, sometimes you're trying to do both. But for example, Uber, when Uber arrives in a city, what does it do? It hugely subsidizes drivers to just be on the platform, even though there's no rides. Uh, and that's enough to start to attract some users that eventually gets the wheel running. So, you know, it, 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 sounded, it was great to hear, you know, Ali and Shahan say that they're now getting people signing up at both sides. You know, why are they doing that? Well, it's partly word of mouth, you know, um, consumer to consumer, but it's also the fact that people know that there's a lot of architects on that site. So why wouldn't I just go there? The fact you've managed to get to that stage and the wheel starting to run gives me a lot of confidence that you're going to have a successful business.
but it's not easy to do, but you know, that's kind of how we did it on Skyscanner to answer the question. I'm going to go to, to YouTube now for a question that's come up on that. You spoke a little bit about the kind of product market fit, and we, and we talk a lot about that in, in um, the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Group. When we're talking to our entrepreneurs, we talk about the innovation sweet spot, desirability, feasibility, and, and viability. And of course, adaptability has kind of been added to that now. But one of the questions is, um, what's the most common risk for a small startup company? Because we work a lot with kind of, you know, student entrepreneurs, uh, some of them, you know, wanting to develop kind of small, small companies rather than going straight for the scale up. So what do you think they should be looking out for in terms of risks? Um, I mean, so I think you have to, first of all, be very comfortable that there's always a very high chance you're going to fail, right? There's always a risk you're going to fail. And failure is a kind of loaded term in, in, in most languages. Um, it's not really failure. What you're trying to do is find out as quickly as possible that you, you, people don't want your product. That, that's really what the Lean Startup is all about. It's about saying, if this isn't a good idea, then how do I find that out as quickly as possible? So for example, rather than spend a year building a back-end database and front-end that's you know actually polished, let's do what the guys did earlier and build a Wix page and see if anyone comes. And if no one comes, then no real harm done. I'll go and do something else in my life. But if, if they do come, then I'll consider how to how to you know to improve things. So I think that a, a risk that that everybody falls into or is very attractive is to not take that approach. Is to is to um, get so caught up in building the product because you enjoy building stuff that you forget that your goal is to find out as quickly as possible that your idea is a bad one. If it turns out to be a good one, that's great. But if it's a bad idea, you want to find out quickly because life isn't very long. Um, I think that's that's a big risk that you just get caught up in activities and forget that you're trying to get to visibility of product market fit as soon as possible. Um, and I, I think the the other risk is that you you fail and you get afraid of failure, so you don't try again, uh, and that's a great loss to the community. You know, you're you're probably going to find your first few ideas aren't, aren't the best. We all hear all these stories about you know someone starts a company and now they're worth five billion. Um, but the more common path is you started a company and absolutely nothing happens. And then you start another one and eventually you, know, you were successful. Um, so it's important to, to me, it's a risk that you either don't seek truth quickly enough or you you don't try again um, when, when you should have done because you've just learned a ton of stuff about startups and your first goal. So why waste that? You know, so th these are the risks I think of. Of course, there's lots of our risks, but, you know, these are the ones I think are fundamental to the startup world. Yeah, I, I agree. And it's interesting when you when we look at the, you know, the, the famed entrepreneurs, if, if you actually look at their backstories, they often have a number of, 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 you know, failures that they've gone through, you know, and learning process that they've gone through before they then hit the, hit the, the idea. And, you know, they've probably pivoted about three or four times before they've actually found that, that sweet spot as well. We've got another question in the room, Mark. I think we've got time for a couple more questions. So we've got one in the room over here with Graham. Yeah. Hello. Uh, so under current economic circumstances, uh, what's the approach that you recommend that startups should have uh, towards getting their first financing opportunity or credit, taking into consideration that most of the startups uh, begin with uh, negative results during the first months or years? So what the approach should they have? Um, I, I don't think that the current conditions really change how I would answer this question, you know, if we if we're in different circumstances. You know, I'll note that you know some of the most successful businesses started during economically really difficult times. You know, Airbnb, Amazon, you know, Amazon with the, the dot com a bubble bursting airbnb with the 2008 uh crash these businesses have emerged uh, out of these times and quite and that's that's quite a common phenomenon and it's often because if you start a business during a given period of time like the one we're in just now you you you're you have the advantage of 
addressing the world the way the world is now. Whereas if you have started a business five years before that, you have the disadvantage of needing to believe that the world hasn't changed because your product and your market and your company's beliefs and strategies built around the world that's changed. And, and that's not something that's easy to accept. So very often businesses born during difficult times go on to be very successful because they had that advantage of no legacy, no sunk costs, and could look at the world without the prejudices and blinkers of wishing the world was the way it used to be. Um, now, in terms of, you know, to more prosaically in terms of capital, um, I, I don't know how things will go in the future. I, I do worry about, about the fact that we're in an inflating equity bubble. Um, I think at some point it will burst. But at the moment, because interest rates are really low, um, there's an awful lot of funds and an awful lot of people uh, searching for other places to make a return. And that in turn has meant that there's actually still quite a lot of, of investment money available for startups. Um, you know, in some cases, crazy money available, uh, which remind me a little bit of the dot-com boom and bust. But um, the point is there's money out there, just as there was before, for good ideas, good startups. Uh, and the other thing is that, you know, a lot of governments um, and, you know, for example, we're in Scotland tonight. So the Scottish government is one example, have quite a lot of grants available via the various agencies to encourage and foster and accelerate a entrepreneurship. And those grants are still available and they're often more available during bad times because governments correctly realize they have to stimulate, you know, a, a new wave of uh, economic activity. So I, I wouldn't... Um, I wouldn't spend a lot of time worrying that this is a bad time to start a business. It might actually be the best time to start a business, but it's not, depending on what, what field you're going to try and go into, of course, um, like I wouldn't rush into travel necessarily, but on the other hand, maybe maybe you should um, for, because of what I was saying earlier. Um, but, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of feel you're at a disadvantage because of this time. It might be the best time. One more question in the room, and then I'll hand back to Nat to Danella for some closing comments. Um, so the one on on YouTube that's coming is around the business model canvas. So she's um, it's Ruth. She's been using the business model canvas. Um, it's okay, but at one time she felt that she was kind of heading heading to failure. What are your thoughts on the use of the business model canvas for for identifying these things? Um, I, I think there's a number of reasonable mechanisms. Um, uh, it's it's often probably not the tool, but, you know, the or the make the the sort of format that you're looking at these things. It's a problem. It's probably something deeper, and it'd be good to go to have a, a chat with Ruth about what she meant by heading to failure and why she thought that. But I don't think that's necessarily the business canvas approach. It's probably something else. Um, and uh, you know, I guess we can't really get into that right now. What that is, but I, I think you know, there's multiple reasonable methods. I, I I always personally try and boil down to the absolute fundamentals, though, because quite often we get caught up in the, you know, the, the methods and tools. But what are the fundamentals? And, uh, for example, tonight in our short session, I, you know, I'm proposing to you that the fundamental is retention and knowing you have it. And you know, I think that's the place to look first when you start to think about are we heading for, for failure? Um, I don't usually start with the particular, you know, tool or methodology I'm using. I, I try to get to the level beneath what's the fundamental physics of this, yes. and that's where I would uh, advise Ruth to focus. But you know, it would probably need to talk live to to properly unpack what Ruth's uh, explore, exploring there. Yeah. Well, Ruth, you can get in touch with innovation at rgu.ac.uk. We'd be happy to to talk to you about your uh, your business model canvas and to support you. With that, that's what we're here for. Um, just pass over to Graham. So we've got one more question in the room and then I'll hand back to Danella. Forward question and just to know if I'm on the safe side too. So uh, is there an average time span before a small to medium sized business fails? Before it fails? Um, I, well, I'm not entirely sh sure, uh, you know, statistically I've got my own experience. Um, I can tell you that you know all those businesses that that get to 100 million annual revenues, 
almost all of them take more than 10 years to do it. So success, depending on where you draw, you know, draw your measure of success, success is a multi-year game in a startup uh, world. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've seen plenty of startups that, that flame out within six months. That's very common. But I've also seen plenty that were sustained by a combination of charismatic founder who told investors a great vision and no doubt believed it and investors willing to keep putting money in and those businesses ran for multiple years but were actually failing the whole time and uh, I think that's the greater tragedy you know um, it's tied up an awful lot of talent an awful lot of people and also someone's money in something that was never going to succeed and that's why you know a lot of what I've been talking about tonight is aimed at those cases um, because nobody had the views that we've been talking about. No one had insight into what their cohorts look like. But they had investor money because they had charisma and they had a good story. And um, they kept spending it until there's no more money to spend. Um, so I think failure, I don't know what the average is, but there's lots that fail very early and there's lots that fail late. And um, you want, if you're going to be in one of those, you want to be in the first category so you can go and do something better. Um, uh, of course, I'd much rather you you were neither category, but if you're going to be in one or the other, try and be in the first category. Yeah, that's great advice. Okay, thanks, Mark. I'll hand over to Danella. I think maybe you've got a question as well. Danella was making copious notes. Me and Danella were both writing lots and lots of notes, weren't we? So I'm sure Danella's got a question for you as well, Mark. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Mark. That's um, just it's such an insightful conversation. Honestly, really enjoyed the presentation, but also the discussion afterwards. And I think we would all agree having sort of a non-cliched objective approach to development has just been really useful to us all, all tonight. So thank you for that. Also like to obviously thank Archilink for, for your, and just great to hear your success now and what you've been doing over the, the time since you first came into this room. So well, do, well done you guys. And also the entrepreneurship and, and innovation group for the work that you've done, Ed behind the scenes, Chris and, and Graham. Thank, thank you so much for that. I am gonna very cheekily ask you for a, a question though. And that's more about the university side. You wouldn't maybe be surprised but to hear that. But, you know, we sometimes look at the Entrepreneurship Innovation Group work, Mark, as almost like a, a small company in its own right or sort of starting off and how we can flourish. Really taken with your, your approach tonight about focusing on trends rather than the point in time. And I think that's a real lesson to us as well within the university. But I wondered if you could share any insights with us as to how RGU or any other university actually actively supports the startup community, whether it's students, staff, or alumni? Yeah, I think, well, thank you very much, Neil, for the question. I think, I think there's, there's a lot of things to consider there. Um, you know, for example, um, it, I, would, I would love us to tear down the walls to some extent between departments um, because, in, in business, you know, innovation happens in businesses when people with different skill sets sit together, literally, or work together without saying, I'm an engineer, so I do code, and I'm a, I'm a marketing person, so I get traffic, and so on. And in a university, I think it'd be a great thing if people from different schools, and I think that's something you're trying to do or are doing, um, collided more often and worked in joint projects together because they start to learn that the value of other skill sets in business and better ideas would come out. So I think that's something that's, that's super important. And that can be done with collider events or summer schools or weekend, you know, product a thons and, and so on and so, so forth. I also think it'd be great if we spent more time teaching our technical graduates some of the things I've just been talking about. And, and there's obviously much more to teach there, but don't just have really great technical graduates, have really great technical graduates who know how startups work in the modern age. That would be a super powerful thing for them to join the other companies, start their own companies, even go into large organizations and be entrepreneurial within them. I think that's something that, that should appear in the syllabus everywhere. I, I, I know a lot of universities are, you know, are, are looking at doing those things. I also think when it comes to spin outs, we should equip our, our academics for success there, we often don't give them the support they need in some of universities to go out and be uh, successful. And I, I finally, I would love to see entrepreneurs and residents come into our universities um, so that they can sit alongside the, their academic colleagues and from first-hand experience infuse some of these ideas. Um, 
I think I think so. We're making the 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 subject practical, not just abstract, um, as it sometimes is in many business schools. So I think these are some of the elements that go towards making a, an entrepreneurial campus. Um, I know you, I know you're working very hard to do a lot of those things and others, um, but these are sort of things I, I'd love to see all the universities in in the country doing because I think it would significantly in time raise the number of successful startups and hence opportunities for people that would follow. You're able to have that one-to-one -one conversation and advise the individual start about the person having the good idea while you're also advising government about the future. So um, really appreciative of your time tonight. And I'm sure everybody here in the room feels exactly the same about it and online. Also. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Round of applause for Mark Logan, please. <laughs> so thanks ever so much, Mark. I'm sure there was a virtual round of applause that everybody's well, uh, we, we could hear it from uh, from here in Garth D. And that concludes our innovation uh, masterclass um, for this evening. Um, fantastic insight, fantastic sort of jump off points for us. So I, I could have listened to Mark all night if I'm honest. I had lots more questions coming in as well on YouTube. So thanks as always to um, our guest speakers, Ali Sheehan uh, and, and Mark, of course. Uh, thanks to our vice principal, uh, Danella Beaton as well for joining us. Ed Pollock, who's behind the scenes on this one. He's let me host this one, but he's been working very hard behind the scenes, um, making sure all the technical wizardry is working. And of course, to the uh, entrepreneurship and innovation group for their continued dedication and hard work. Did he appear? Did he appear? <laughs> That's great. And of course, thanks to the audience, the ones in here. Uh, thank you. Give yourself a round of applause for coming tonight. Thank you. Um, and those of you watching online, uh, a date for your diaries is our next one. Our next masterclass is on Monday, the 8th of uh, November, uh, when Laurel and Aishal Quinn, co-founders of Sustainably, um, will be presenting on how impact-focused startups can pay off. If you want the schedule for our masterclass series, you can go on our, um, our website, www.rgu.ac.uk forward slash innovation, or you can follow us on Instagram or Twitter at RGU Innovation to get all the news. So until next time, um, continue to innovate, be curious, be entrepreneurial, and most of all, stay safe, and hopefully we'll see you next time. So goodbye from here in Garthie and Aberdeen, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Goodbye, and thank you. <laughs>